You're listening to the Armchair Ninja podcast. Here is your host, Rich. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Armchair Ninja podcast. It is Thursday, April 7th, 2016. My name is Rich, and with me this week, uh, my first co-host is Bijan. How are you making out? Doing good, man. What's up? Not much. We actually have a special guest with us this week. We have Cameron Aaron. How are you making out, Cameron? Hey, doing great. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. If that name sounds familiar to you, uh, we have mentioned Cameron a couple times on the show in the past. Cameron was one of our first, I believe, uh, fans of the week. And uh, we've also mentioned her uh, blog before because she's done some interviews with Michelle Warnke and other ninjas. And uh, she was also up for the American Ninja Warrior blogger job. So we brought her on the show to talk to us about that and a few other things. Uh, She's attended some of the tapings, so she's got lots of insight for us. So uh, thank you very much, Cameron, for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. You know, you're kind of like the Wonder Woman to our Batman and Superman. I'm so glad you're finally here. (laughs) Awesome. I am too. It's been, you know, kind of a long time coming. I've been very excited to come on. You're welcome anytime. Ah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that's. I feel like we're going to talk about that quite a bit uh, this episode, so that's probably going to take up most of the time, but we do have a few announcements as far as uh, the season for A&W and Spartan Ultimate Team Challenge, and of course our video of the week. So let's get started. Uh, first things first, I guess, uh, Cameron, let's talk about this this blogger job. So you actually already have a blog. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's called Real, um, and it's realfeministstories.wordpress.com. And I interview, it's a feminist blog, and I interview everyday feminists doing amazing things. So um, I actually interviewed Joyce uh, Shabazz and Michelle Warnke before I started this blog for an article I was writing about the women of American Ninja Warrior, but I have included them on this blog, and I just uh, love doing interviews. I love listening to people's stories, and I have some interviews on there with, you know, with um, people that I know who are doing amazing things, you know, from filmmakers to activists to people who are creating um, community spaces um, to my latest one is about a vegan blog, travel blogger. Um, Yeah. And um, have some other exciting interviews coming up too. Interesting. Um, What inspired you to originally talk about American Ninja Warrior? Was there a particular athlete? Um, God, I've just been a fan of the show for a while. I've just become obsessed with the show. (laughs) Hey, I don't blame you. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So I'm a total nerd about American Ninja Warrior without being an actual ninja myself. Um, But I have an athletic background. So, I mean, I've always been an athlete. And so it's no surprise. And I've always been interested in, like, alternative sports or extreme sports. Um, I was a runner, so that's kind of a freak sport. And um, so sports that aren't in the mainstream, I guess you could say, I was always interested in. And I guess that's why American Ninja Warrior kind of appealed to me. Also, my mom has been a longtime watcher of the show. She's been watching since the Japanese versions were on TV. Um, so I have her to thank. And then um, I, I mean, honestly, I became more obsessed with it when – you know, Casey and Megan and Michelle started making history. And I was like, okay, this is getting really interesting. More women are doing it and they're doing better and they're, you know, doing these amazing things. So, okay, you really, you know, have my interest. Um, and that's really what got me like obsessed with it, <laughs> if you will, really passionate. Yeah, I think most people felt that same way, especially seeing Casey Kenanzaro. I think that's like when the first huge boom happened, right? Yes. Exactly. I think that really boosted the ratings of the show and got more people or almost, you know, everyone um, had heard of it in some way or another, you know, because Mm -hmm. of her, I think. Yeah, especially with women, it seemed to really strike a chord. There's so many 
submission videos and stuff where they reference her as being the inspiration for them starting. And I think with this wave that we had with Team Ninja Warrior, we'll probably see more and more of that. Absolutely. I think so. I'm really excited about the women that were on Team Ninja Warrior. I went to that taping, and so um, I'm glad it's already aired, so now we can talk about it. But, um, yeah, it was really exciting to see, you know, more women, you know, being awesome. And um, and then I hope some of those women are going to do um, season eight of American Ninja Warrior because I would be really excited to see what they can do on that course. So excited for that. Yeah, because we've got a bunch of new names, I guess, that we know that have become uh, household names. So we have more than just those three or four women that that we've cheered on that have made it up the work wall. We have all these extra women that have done it now, like Jennifer Tavernier. We want to see how she does next season. I hope to God she's going to be on there. Oh, yeah. She's fantastic. I hope she is, too. <laughs> From party time? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, she's she's great. And the one girl, I'm blinking on her name, but she was on Flip Rodriguez's team. Oh, yeah. Tiana Weberly. Yeah, I was just thinking her, too. Yeah, So good. <laughs> She's going to do great. And she's just been starting. That's the thing with her that's so interesting is that she is really a rookie to the sport. Yeah. But it seems like she's been training really well with Flip and JJ. And um, I'm amazed by her. You know, it could come as a kind of like a, a good thing for her and a lot of the newbies from the show. The fact that they're not acclimated to the old obstacles. They're kind of um, being introduced to all these new obstacles and maybe it'll work to their benefits because maybe a lot of the older ninjas that train on these old obstacles every single day, they're not necessarily primed for the new techniques that are going to be um, implemented for the new obstacles. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's keeping it fresh for them. Um, mm -hmm. They're constantly being introduced to new obstacles. That's, yeah, I think you're right. That's going to help in their benefit. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll see that some of the star, some of the people that go out of their way to do that. So we'll we have people like um, Bill Westrick, for example, that goes and makes his own obstacles and changes up the courses for himself. And uh, I know Jamie Ron does the same thing. And I've seen uh, Drew Dreschel. You know, the the top ones do that too. Sometimes they'll totally throw. Uh, curveballs at themselves just to make sure that they can readjust and do new things all the time yeah exactly I, that that's what i would do if i were them <laughs> if i had ambition that's exactly what i would do too. Yeah. well you have ambition you have this podcast that's right this is where i spent my time <laughs> just uh, this is my little contribution so <laughs> so backing up to the the blogger job a little bit uh what was the interview process like did you just email in like a, a resume or sample work or how did that go? Yeah, it was kind of um, almost divine intervention. I feel like of how I found out about that job. It, a friend of mine saw the job posted online and she sent it to me and said, this would be perfect for you. And I looked at it and I almost cried because <laughs> it really was everything that I wanted and um, I was so excited I mean it had I was just like this is this is for me I'm so perfect for this and I they have an application that you well you're supposed to send in your resume a cover letter and fill out a couple other things that they have there on the application and then you send also three writing samples so it sounds like pretty much any journalism job application. Yes, I guess so. I mean, I've never applied for, um, you know, a journalism job before. And actually, I really mm -hmm. haven't applied for a job in a really long time because I've been self-employed for for a while. <laughs> so I had to come up with, I just spent a couple of days um, pumping out a resume and a cover letter. and But it got their attention. And they about a little, I, I think, yeah, like a little over a week after I sent in my application, I heard back from, I heard from them. They emailed me, Vox Media emailed me and said, we would like to have an interview with you. And they suggested an interview for the next day. And um, 
So I had my first interview the next day and it went really well. Um, I felt like we connected. I just, um, I just felt like it went really well. I mean, I really haven't had a lot of job interviews in my life because, like I said, I've been self-employed. But um, I was very excited about it. And then he said, well, I'm going to advance you to the next round. Uh, I was thrilled. I'm like, yes. And But he didn't say when he would get back to me. So I waited and I waited and I waited. <laughs> and I think it was a week later I got another email from a different person who works for Vox Media saying I'd like you know like to set up an er an interview with you and so we scheduled that for like three days later and had that interview and I felt like that interview went well um too and and you know they said that I was um a top candidate and also they they said that they would get back to me that that week and um they got back to me i think it was four days later and said i was a final candidate but they ended up choosing somebody else which was a terrible terrible choice and we don't support that <laughs> at all so Aww. if you're listening anybody from vox media you've made the wrong choice cameron is the person unless you know you just come out of the nowhere and hired Bijan behind my back, and then uh, I guess I can't really say much about that. <laughs> You'll never know until it's announced. Well, thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Um, it was definitely a bummer. Um, I really thought that all the signs were leading to me getting that job, but because um, it was combining so many of my passions and desires and qualifications. I mean, I'm, I was very qualified for it. Um, but I guess it wasn't meant to be, um, but I'm, you know, I'm still obviously a huge fan of the show and obsessed with it and that's not going to change. And, you know, my desire to interview and, and, and to even interview more ninjas, which I do have coming up and, and writing, you know, about the show that doesn't change either. So, yeah, it's good. It's good to stay positive because it's not that. It doesn't change what you can do. You can certainly still blog about it. You don't need to. You don't need them in order to do that. And uh, I think we've proven uh, the ninjas are very accessible to just with anybody that wants to talk to them. So that's a, a great thing from them to uh, to help with the community and help uh, you. I do. You'll be able to do that as well, I guess. And uh, so I'd be really interested to see what interviews you have coming up. We'll definitely be checking them out and sharing them on the show awesome. when you do. Well, I can't wait to share. Uh, so what kind of questions? I'm a little curious, I guess. Were they quizzing you on your knowledge of the show or just asking about... I, I'm just not sure yeah. what that what that kind of interview would sound like. I was hoping that they would quiz me on the show. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. then I could be like, oh, yeah, here, let me tell you. Um, you know, they did have me write a a recap of any episode that I wanted. And um, I've... I felt confident about it. I still feel confident about it. Um, I chose the, to write about the Venice finals from last year. Um, and yeah, but, and, and I think it was very clear in that recap and in my cover letter and resume that I, I had a lot of knowledge about the show. Um, but no, they didn't ask me questions like that. They really, um, were asking, more well the the both of the interviews were different um the second interview definitely went deeper into like the relationship between NBC and Vox Media and I don't know how much yeah. I can talk about that um but you know NBC obviously is like the overseer but they're they're teaming up with Vox Media and how much freedom I would have as a blogger, you know, because I'd be blogging for SB Nation, but NBC is the overseer. And, you know, what would I do if they didn't like something that I write, you know, and stuff like mm -hmm. that? They asked me about that. And then they asked me, I'm trying to remember, um, you know, asked me what my, you know, experiences and why I would be, you know, a good fit for it and what, um, 
if I'm like what my day to day life looks like, like how available am I for this job? And I'm very available. (laughs) (laughs) Self-employed. I was, that was, you know, that was definitely um, something going for me. Um, But yeah, I think they, it, it, no, it wasn't really so much how much you know about the show, but they definitely wanted somebody who's passionate about it. And they did say that it is clear that I was passionate about it. That's good. Um, Traditionally in these types of jobs, I think what they're looking for mostly is somebody that can engage the most with the audience. I think um, knowledge of the show is secondary because I'm probably sure they they feel like it can be learned. Um, It sounds like you've got all the the right facets. Probably what happened is there were a lot of options for them. So they just um, maybe went, flipped a coin, you know, and choose a route. But it's really cool that, you know, you were so available and so open to it and you got so far. I I have to imagine that if things don't work out with the person they chose, you've got to be right up there for their second pick. I sure hope so. Yeah, thank you. I, I think so, too. And, you know, that is that is something else is like I, you know, hopefully I will stay on their radar if, um, you know, if it doesn't work out with this other person or if another position that's similar opens up if they decide to you know, open up another position um, like it, you know, hopefully they'll keep me in mind. I did email them after I got the disappointing news and I did say, you know, please keep me in mind for future. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) That's a good idea. Yeah, definitely a good idea. Yeah. All right. So lots of cool information there. Um, Moving on, we had the, uh, I'm going to call them audience tips. So basically uh, we're going to, it almost feels like an interview here, <laughs> Cameron. That wasn't my intention, but we're uh, we just ha- you have so much good information that we want to get it as much as we can. Um, so Bijan and I are both going to be going to tapings. It seems uh, we're definitely trying to. Bijan, you get your tickets, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to be at the tapings for the LA. Um, yeah, the LA tapings. Um, I believe May or sorry, not May, April six. It's going to be that Wednesday night. So I'm going to be going to that taping. So you're going to the final. Yes, definitely. Good choice. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not gonna sit through like a bunch of people just falling into the water for no reason. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Wait a second. Did you say April six? Yes. Yeah, it's coming up, man. Wow, it's coming up really fast. Actually, when this airs, uh, like I'll be posting this on April seventh, probably. So <laughs> it's actually uh, already happened. It's in the past now. It happened yesterday. Yes. That's so cool. Yeah, it's true. Uh, So can we, uh, that's perfect then. So if it's that fast, um, what, what would you suggest to Bajan? So anything uh, as far as, did they provide you, I guess we'll start with this. Bajan, did they give you like information on, make sure you don't wear like, a t-shirt with a slogan and, yeah, yeah. and all these guns are little the two like the two main things that they say is don't wear any um clothing with clear look logos on them and don't wear plain white tees um i, I think the the white tees will stand out a lot to the cameras so i'm guessing they don't want that um they also say you know dress good for the weather the taping is going to be running from 10 30 to 4 a.m so i'm going to be dressing a little warm you know <laughs> definitely for uh the, the colder um weather um other than that you know it should be good i'm just gonna be wearing like my nike gear that doesn't have like a bunch of nike logos on them you know just like regular nike gear um a lot of my sports clothing and yeah it's it sounds like a lot of fun i'm really excited for the fact that it's at universal studios just for the fact that i don't have to worry about parking sounds like the whole universal studios parking lot's gonna be open to us so that sounds really fun um yeah, Cameron, you have a lot of experience with these tapings. So, anything that I should know that they probably don't didn't tell me. Yeah. Um, so, I think it also says on the ticket, you know, you can't bring your cell phone and maybe uh, yeah. water or something like that. You can bring your cell phone. <laughs> Good, because um, I plan to sneak that in. <laughs> they did. They did yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, I learned that the hard way in Vegas. And um, the first night I didn't bring my cell phone because I thought, you know, I I just didn't want to take the chance. And um, Mm -hmm. then everybody had their cell phones, of course. And I mean, what are they going to do? Take everybody's cell phones? So, I mean, that is a little silly. But I so everybody I mean, I had no idea when my Vegas was my first um, 
experience in the audience and so I didn't know what it was going to be like but everybody was taking photos with the ninjas and I was really regretting not having my cell phone but I went back you know the second night so and that was really the night to be there because I got to see you know Isaac win it and but I brought my cell phone and I had my goals of people I wanted photos with and I got them (laughs) so it all worked out But yeah, definitely you can bring the cell phone and bring water and food. So at Team Ninja and at Vegas, you got to bring water and food and they don't have water and food there for you. So, I mean, maybe they will at Universal because I don't, it's Universal. I don't know, but they certainly didn't at Team Ninja and they certainly didn't in Vegas because they were, I mean, they weren't near any you know, type of food things anyway, but definitely bring those things. Okay. I'm going straight from an all day shift at work straight to the tapings in LA. So, uh, I'm definitely going to be hungry. So (laughs) thanks for the advice. I'm definitely getting food. So I don't know what time you're planning on getting there, but I say get there early, as early as you can. I'll probably arrive 30 minutes before they tape. (laughs) That's not good. It's not, it's not ideal. Um, I mean, because they usually well they seem to change it up every time but you know you might not get the best seat if you're Mm -hmm. you know later um if you show up later because there is definitely a line but you never know if in vegas where they filmed it it was a big lot and they couldn't you know, manage everybody. So you got to move around from one bleacher to another, or you could stand or so there was a lot of freedom in Vegas and team Ninja warrior. They were kind of being more restrictive um, about that. And they wanted you to kind of stay put wherever they had put you originally. And thankfully I got the best seats. I just, I happened to get the best bleachers. So right by the warp wall, you know, you want to see how it all ends, but um you know, you don't, I don't know how they're going to do it in LA, but I would say, you know, if for anyone who's listening and is going to a TV taping, I would say show up as early as you can and bring, and you can eat in line, you know, if you want to bring your dinner and eat in line, like I would do that. I did that in Vegas. Okay. And you, you said the, um, the best seats to get are going to be closer towards the warped wall, correct? Well, yeah. So not for the finals course, but for the qualifying course, of course. You know, you're going to want the bleachers that are right by there, I would say. Um, All right. I mean, you won't see everyone because not everyone's going to make it that far. But it's always I think it's always better to see it when somebody finishes a course, you know, and then you can cheer with them. And and then that obstacle that's right before the warp wall, you get to see that, too. And um I don't know. It was just there were more ninjas hanging out around that one as well. And it was just more there's more excitement around that area. Um, But then I guess in the finals, um, you would probably I don't know where you would want to be, I guess, maybe in the middle. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you want to be there for the exciting parts, especially during the qualifiers. Uh, It makes sense. If anything, I'm going to try to get off work early, but we'll see. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's some good uh, advice. I hadn't thought of the fact that if you if you sit next, if you move over near the warped wall, you might not get to see some of your favorite ninjas because they might actually fall early. You're, you can never really be sure. Yes, that is true. That is one disadvantage of that. So, you know, um, I guess there is advantage of being in the bleachers right by the quintuple steps. But um, I don't know. I don't find that personally as exciting Um, because you only really get to see that obstacle (laughs) yeah the one people are doing like no problem yeah exactly there was a lot of talk about like the the different atmosphere between the two since you kind of saw both i mean you i guess it's not a fair comparison because you were in vegas which would have been more exciting anyway but um did you find it the team ninja warrior atmosphere to be like really really exciting the way the ninjas have described it Um, well, I actually found Vegas to be more exciting. So we'll just, we'll compare it to the first night in Vegas, you know, before we knew anybody was going to win it. 
um, or had a chance of winning it. Um, so the first night in Vegas is just stage one. And I mean, it is a little more exciting because it's the finals. Um, but I don't know. There, there was more, there was more excitement there for sure. Um, they were have, they had some trouble getting audience members for the team Ninja Warrior one. And I think partly because they decided to tape it during the day on a weekday. Ooh. Yeah, it was strange. It was a little weird. Yeah, and I mean, as somebody who's self-employed, I was able to go, of course. But a lot of people actually that were there had called in sick. So, I mean, <laughs> to work, you know, because <laughs> how else would you make it? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So, And there were kids there, too. So I was a little confused about that. But there were actually, there was like a coach um, who took his soccer team his high school soccer team there and there was um a teacher at a high school in bakersfield that took his film class there to to the table so it was definitely interesting crowd um but they did kind of struggle to find some people so you you really didn't have a problem getting in it was exciting um but there it seemed to be less people who really knew the show at Team Ninja Warrior than in Vegas. Um, in Vegas, it seemed to be more like true fans, people who had been watching for a while and they knew the ninjas and and stuff. So it was just more exciting there. Really? So that's interesting. The You're saying that the, the crowd basically was the more novice people that weren't really familiar with the show at Team Ninja Warrior? Like they were... Uh, people that were just well, <laughs> there's a lot of kids dragged there from their classes to uh, to watch. So maybe they don't even watch the show. They're just like, hey, yeah, run up that that wall thing. Yeah, there were kids and adults. I don't know why. I think maybe people just were like, oh, I want to go to a TV taping. Um, but I would ask a lot of people around me, you know, oh, who, what ninjas are you looking forward to, or what do you? And they'd be like, oh, I I don't know. You know, I don't really watch it or I don't have a favorite ninja or I don't know. And so it was kind of strange. (laughs) It's funny. You had like the opposite experience that I had because when I went to the main warrior gym for that competition, I expected it to mainly be uh, the competitors and their friends and family. And yet most of the people I talked to said, no, I've, I've never been here before. I traveled from a nearby town. I loved the show and I wanted to see it in person. So oh, wow. it, it was definitely more hardcore fans that were there. Hmm. Yeah. And Team Ninja, there were no family members there except except for a few um, because it was so last minute. Um, it was just the last minute show <laughs> that they decided to do. And um, really like Michelle's parents were and and Erica, I don't know if you remember her on Drew Dressel's team. Erica Cook? Yeah, Erica was. Cook. Her yeah. mom was there. And then Michelle's parents were there cheering. But really, other people's families didn't come. Um, and I think it's because it was just so last minute. And, of course, they weren't paying for the families to come either. But um, Yeah, I do remember the tapings were kind of just chosen at random and it was a really inconvenient time for when they were taping. So I definitely can see why a lot of friends and family couldn't make it out for that taping. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So I'm not sure if we've announced this before. Let's, let's take a look at the dates that we're looking at now. So, uh, American Ninja Warrior is going to premiere on June 1st. Yes. So that's kind of come up fast. Like it's, it seemed like it was so far away for so long, and now I'm realizing that's only two months away. That is not that long. No, it's really going to go by quite fast. Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Me too. <laughs> I am so ready. <laughs> Me too. So I have a question for you two. Um, after, sure. Now that you've seen Team Ninja, um, what do you prefer? Do you prefer Team Ninja Ooh. over American Ninja Warrior or American Ninja Warrior over Team Ninja? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, I like the prospect of Team Ninja Warrior. I feel like they can 
they can improve it. There are some kinks in the format, which um, I feel like if they if they adjust some of the format of Team Ninja Warrior, I feel like it could be a much more exciting show than American Ninja Warrior. But for how it is right now, American Ninja Warrior takes the cake. It's still, or at least how I view it, these competitors against this daunting obstacle course. And it's just so fun to watch. Um, for casual viewers, though, I feel like Team Ninja Warrior has the prospects of being a much more exciting show for the masses. Right. Yeah, I don't know if I can pick between them. It's like choosing a child, <laughs> right? I don't know if I prefer one over the other. They're uh, they're both awesome in their own way. I I really liked the you know format aside, I guess, with the as far as the point system goes. I liked the pacing of Team Ninja Warrior a lot better than than American Ninja Warrior. There was there was backstory. Um, I mean, a lot of them are familiar names, so I guess to be fair that they can do that a little abbreviated, but uh, I liked that they would give a little blurb and then they'd run, they'd blurb, run, blurb, run. And we had like so many going through and the having them f- square off that way, I thought was so exciting. I, I really, really can't wait to see next season already. I'm already, I, I want to see the pairings that we missed this season, right? We didn't get to see some of the ones we were really looking forward to. We didn't get our flip versus drew, uh, competition and ones like that i want to see casey versus megan you know some of those bigger names. oh yeah i do too i want to see casey and megan and jesse all you know competing and michelle all compete against each other i mean i think that would actually i think that would boost the ratings i mean i think that would be in their favor to you know to do that because that would be so exciting um but yeah you both of you bring up really good points i think I mean, I'm definitely excited about Team Ninja Warrior, and I think you're right. I think for the casual viewer, it's going to be more exciting. Um, I personally am still preferring American Ninja Warrior, and I'm trying to figure out why. I think it's mostly because I do prefer individual sports over team sports. And mm. I so American Ninja Warrior is, you know, one individual going at a time and it's really kind of them against themselves. I mean, you know, if they make it to Vegas, then they are, you know, and like, you know, with Jeff and Isaac, then you're obviously competing more against the other people. Um, but uh, there is something about that for me that's a little bit more appealing. And my mom feels the same way, but I, I can't quite figure out what that's all about. I think it's the creativity of the obstacles. Every single episode, you've got a different obstacle course with American Ninja Warrior. Whereas Team Ninja Warrior, you have pretty much the same course throughout the entire season. So um, the stagnants can get a little daunting or repetitious after a certain while. Um, But, you know, those are format things that maybe they can switch it up for next season with Team Ninja Warrior. It really has the opportunity to become something really huge if they do make the right changes. But with that said, American Ninja Warrior, it's always going to be this hallmark just because it's so much more personable. It's basically just watching this one person compete against such a daunting task. And I don't really think any other show um, has this kind of level of... I guess, um, difficulty and personal dis- difficulty. So um, it's really exciting and cool to watch. Good point. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I think the the fact that it has to be so flawless is kind of what draws you in. Mm-hmm. And in Team Ninja Warrior, it, it's not necessarily, it's about being fast. And if you fall, then, well, there's another round and there's other opportunities and, a, and other teammates to pick up the slack. So it was nice to see them being able to kind of open up that way and give everything they had, but they can't do that on the show normally. They have to be a little more methodical and perfect uh, all the way through. Maybe that's why I prefer it more. Um, But I think you're right. Like, I mean, it's almost like choosing, you know, your favorite child or something. They definitely (laughs) are both awesome for different reasons. I really hope that, you know, both of them continue for a very long time. And one of the things, actually, now that, that we're talking about this, is that NBC, I hope I'm allowed to say this, you know, or, well, I'll say this. Um, SB Nation wants to um, basically treat American Ninja Warrior more like a sport. 
Good. And, yes. And, you know, NBC is, you know, at the end of the day, it's a TV show, right? So there's that kind of like, okay, you know, is it a sport or is it a TV show? And I think what I was, what I think was being insinuated was that the the blog, so whoever got this position, you know, that that could help it become more of a sport and that it would kind of transition more into that category eventually. And I personally would love to see that. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's kind of like the hallmark of these um, niche, you know, more extreme sports out there. Um, and I'm glad that they're going the route of um, Spartan Race and the Mud Runs as a secondary thing with it. Because I feel like these two things, they're very different, but they complement each other very well. So I can definitely see them um, having this like kind of like cornering the market of these type of sports. Um, and yeah, I definitely can see them going for that and kind of making it part of their programming. It's, it's interesting that they're going to have the, the new Spartan show come on at the same time at, or, you know, during the same um, period as American Ninja Warrior. You have to assume that that's not for, you know, that there's a reason for that. I'm pretty sure they want to kind of complement each other and hopefully American Ninja Warrior can boost up the rating and the notoriety of the Spartan show. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so if we, we've got the date for that as well. So the Spartan Ultimate Team Challenge, they say, is going to be June 13th, which means that it's not going to be on the same night um, as you thought maybe they would be, Bijan, the you know, where they kind of one led into the other. Or yeah, it it's a different night. Yeah, it is a different night that they're recording, which is inter- or that it comes on, which is interesting, but... Um, at least it's in the same network on during the same period that they'll be um, going. So they can have ads and commercials for um, each show while the other is going on. And most importantly, we have two separate nights we can record because <laughs> we're trying that, to cover man. both of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you know if any of the ninjas are going to be doing the Spartan race as well? Or can they not do both? We know at least one is, and that's Grant McCartney. Oh, okay. Grant's doing both. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's the one featured in the, the poster that they've been circling the image of uh, someone getting stepped on. Oh, interesting. And I, it sounded to me uh, on the Wolfpack Ninja podcast that Kevin Bull sounded like he's going to be on it, but I it wasn't 100% clear. Okay. Well, that'll yeah, cause be exciting. It, yeah, yeah, it was it wasn't I guess my confusion was was he just talking about a Spartan race in general or the actual TV show because they've got the they have Spartans all the time, right? But John, you've run Spartans all the time, man. <laughs> you run them all the time? Yeah, I'm doing a uh, one in August. I'm doing another one in September. I've run two already this year, so <laughs> Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I do them um, a lot. Uh, my body is pretty much worn down at this point, so <laughs> I don't know how long I'm going to be doing them, but I'm still doing them. Well, that's awesome, and good luck. Thanks, Cameron. You say you're a runner and into and, you know into fitness. I guess have you done any mud runs or anything like that? Or I did do a mud run a while ago. Um, yeah, I was doing marathons and ultra marathons, just a couple ultras. Um, I won one of them, <laughs> but wow. wow. Well, it was, I mean, I won for women, and... Um, hey, that's no small feat. <laughs> there weren't that many women, but um, there weren't that many people to begin with. It was kind of, um, you know, a very ridiculous race. Uh, it was uh, a six-hour race in San Francisco, and it was um, one-mile loops that you just do for six hours. Ugh. <laughs> wow. I, no offense but as a runner that sounds incredibly boring <laughs> yeah, yeah it sounded it sounded like such a challenge that that's why i wanted to do it and i wasn't even really trained for it um but because i wasn't trained for it i was i was smart about it i did run walk it um good and, um, but I ended up winning for women anyway, but I did it with a friend and we chatted the whole time. I mean, we made six hours feel like two hours. I don't know how that happened. So I haven't, I ran for 20 years. 
I started running when I was eight. Um, and I'm taking a, a long break and I'm doing more yoga and I still do strength training and cardio, of course. I, I mean, I work out. I was a, I was a fitness trainer. You recently moved, right? You moved to LA? I did. Yes. So was that, you know, I don't know, what is it with LA or California? I don't know. <laughs> you have to be into fitness to live there. Is that like a requirement to oh, get into the state? Yeah. Okay. So, but I'm from Colorado originally and people are really fit in Colorado. So I grew up in an athletic family, but, um, so I moved to California, I guess it was eight and a half years ago. And, um, in the Bay area, not everyone is into fitness and definitely moving to LA is the big change in that. I mean, Mm -hmm. everyone in LA is fit. I mean, it's, it's a lot of the bodies look very, look very much, you know, the same. Like you, you have to fit a certain mold. Um, you can probably attest to this, but the the style of clothing, because San Diego takes a lot from LA and vice versa. Um, the style of clothing out here in San Diego, and I've noticed this is also true in um, LA, is if you're in the range between, I'd say teenager to 30 uh, maybe even after that you're going to be wearing almost exclusively um, athletic clothing you're going to see a lot of um, compression tights and yoga pants stuff like that yeah and the men will be like muscle shirts and shorts stuff like that Um, it's just part of the um, the cultural fabric in the clothing out here right (laughs) well it is i mean it is warmer weather and you know i mean to see people wearing I, i definitely wanted to move somewhere warmer and and LA is a lot warmer than the Bay Area. It really is. Um, and I wanted to live somewhere where I could wear shorts and tank tops most of the year. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, people are really, and it's funny because I left my fitness career right before moving to LA <laughs> and then I go to LA and it's just like fitness everywhere. And, and people are really, they really look fit there. It's interesting, the the focus on one's appearance and fitness. And then, you know, people drive nicer cars, and it's definitely more, you know, it's definitely a different culture. So it's funny, as an outsider, I guess, looking to, uh, looking to Hollywood and things, it's not so much that they hire only good-looking extras, as that's what you get. You just comb the streets, and that's everybody that you pull in off the street <laughs> is going to be... Uh, gonna look like that it's kind of true and i mean i did i have been walking on venice beach quite a bit Uh, it's really nice um beach um there you can avoid the tourist parts and um there are a lot of people on that beach just you know doing pull-ups doing you know like ninja style training you know Mm -hmm. i mean a lot of people work out running doing a lot of you know really hard exercises and just so yeah it's it it does seem to be kind of like everybody's lifestyle oh yeah oh here it's surfing i don't surf but go to san diego it race surfs i don't know (laughs) (laughs) i could see that yeah then crossfit now i think about it oh yeah that's big that's big Mm -hmm. okay so we're gonna move on to the video of the week uh, this week we have a video from Gabe. I don't know if this is his real name or not. This is what his username is. I'm going to go with it. Uh, Gabe Hawkeye, which is actually a fantastic name. If that is what his real awesome name is. Awesome last name, man. Uh, so Gabe has a video of him at Apex Movement NorCal where he got first place in a competition there. And man, did he kill it. Awesome job. Yeah, it was cool, uh, but, man. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I didn't know no, you. No, to I was going to throw it over to you anyway. What, what do you got? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does a lot of really cool things. Shout out to the um, the course design. I mean, the course design had some really creative obstacles, and it, it, he kind of like demos it and goes through the entire course, and he does it flawlessly. You know, um, yeah, just going over some highlights. I mean, they have a kind of like a ring swing to a. Um, a parallel bar that he grabs and then it goes to you know how um in the cargo net from team ninja warrior you kind of stand on this little bench thing that swings you they have something where it's from the ceiling that little bench thing and you carry you grab it from your hands and you have to swing this huge huge gap to two um parallel nunchucks in front of you and you have to grab that and then do another swing from there and it just looks incredibly difficult not only for your upper body but also your grip um 
So yeah, there's some really cool stuff. And then from there, they have a lot of challenging obstacles that challenge your grip, like um, you know the the I don't know what you call it the upwards rings or whatever i i forget the names of for these things and you know warped wall the um the new advanced warped wall they got some really cool stuff man yeah i love the uh the swing that you were talking about so it, it was almost like a almost like a trapeze type deal where he swings over and grabs onto the oh what are those called they're like stringy nunchucks they're not like the they're like the rubber band style ones yeah 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 those are pretty cool Cameron, what did, what did you think of the video? Oh, I thought it was great. Um, yeah, he definitely looks strong. Um, I'm looking forward to um, to seeing him compete. So he's a total newbie? It seems that way. Like yeah. it, Some of the related videos are him uh, testing out the Team Ninja Warrior course, which he also crushed it on and did really well. It was really cool to watch kind of amateur like cell phone video of someone doing that course before the ninjas did. Yeah. And that course looks really hard. Um, I actually had a client before I moved who I felt like, you know, he was in really good shape and I told him to go to this gym because, you know, Alan, um, they do offer adult ninja classes and I told him that he should go to one of them, and he did. He went to one of them, and it. he said it was so much harder than it looks. I mean, he couldn't get up the wall at all, and he could barely do the rings, and, and, and he has really good upper body strength, and he's really, like, fit. But, I mean, so, I mean, for seeing what all this guy does, I mean, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, for sure. And what was the... Uh the name when we were talking about this earlier Bajan, you called them the uh the bookend pegs or book pegs <laughs> book pegs yeah yeah so there's um this particular obstacle that's showing up in a lot of new um ninja gyms that i've noticed where the they're kind of like flat boards um they they look to me like books but you know they're more like they're they're boards if you're if you're like trying to get a feel for what they look like and you kind of have to grab them from one end and since there's nothing like a chain or anything where you can kind of grab onto you're just grabbing off of the side and squeezing as hard as you can imagine the floating door the floating doors from stage three but very very small versions of them and you can only grab this the sides of them with your hand and that's kind of what they're like and there's a bunch of them and you have to grab from side to side um each one gunning across this thing and it looks just incredibly difficult and shout out to every gym that's implementing them they look like a really fun obstacle to um learn to i guess you know conquer and i really hope they they um make this a part of the new ninja warrior course because i can see this being a huge huge um i guess obstacle for a lot of people that haven't trained on it i mean ooh, in terms of grip obstacles that's that's got to be up there i can see that being a new um, obstacle in the course that looks extremely difficult. I think the rock climbers are definitely going to excel at that. And then mm -hmm. people who aren't used to rock climbing, I think are really going to have to train hard on it. Yeah. Can you imagine like, um, the, Oh my God, I forgot its name. Cliffhanger cliffhanger. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Can you imagine the ultimate cliffhanger to these boards? Like that would just destroy somebody's forearms, right? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, I can see Isaac doing it, but wow, it yeah. would be. It'd be Isaac, Ian, Do Ian Dory, maybe Jeff Britton. <laughs> right. That's it. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Robbie, sure. but who knows? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, yeah. have you seen the videos of Casey doing the cliffhanger in her training? Yeah, she's a beast. Oh, my God. I mean, she can do all this stuff. It's just kind of a matter of getting her getting the speed down and like i just i want to see a woman do stage three so bad for her i feel like stage two is going to be the hardest for her stage two has a few obstacles that just are not made for somebody her size especially i have a lot of problems with that butterfly wall where yeah. they don't have any springboard or anything where you have to just jump that gap and if you're somebody casey catanzaro's size i mean how are you going to make that gap um so i've got some issues with that but she did jump from one pole to the other one when she, in the in the finals, the Dallas finals course that she completed, 
Mm-hmm. That, that was a smaller gap, though. And for the butterfly wall, it's not just, you know, grabbing a little ledge um, from one to the other. But for the butterfly wall, you can't just jump parallel and go down a little bit and still be able to grab the obstacle. You have to jump upwards. You, you not only have to go straight, but also upwards. To grab. You're right. That is what they have to do. And then what about, what is it called? The the last, well, the second to last obstacle on stage two that everybody, almost everybody misses. Oh, the new one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Roulette row. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, wow. I mean, you really have, oh, man, you really have to get that right. Mm-hmm. One shot. One shot. It. She wouldn't be able to grab the second one and hang there the way some of them did. Well, Megan no. Martin can, because she did it in mm-hmm. Team Ninja. And but those are a little different, though, right? They're not. They are a little different, but she is. Yeah. T- a, well, she's not taller, but I think she might have wider wingspan. She's got a wingspan, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She she's. Does. I think she's like five four. She is, so she's not that tall, but she definitely has a wider wingspan. But yeah, the stage two is going to be dif- difficult. But do you two think that? What do you think? Do you think uh, we're going to see our first woman complete stage one this year? I, I think, well, I, I just don't know what t- stage one's going to look like. Ultimately, though, I think we will eventually see somebody. And I feel like the biggest course or part of the course to conquer for a female athlete is going to be stage two. I actually think stage three is going to be really easy for, not easy, but I feel like it's going to be a lot more doable than a lot of the male athletes for a woman um, with stage three. Because women are lighter or, you know, I, I think there's there's a lot of natural gifts for the, the female athletes that we've seen on the show where they can probably conquer a lot of stage three. I think stage two is going to be the really hard one for them. Especially because of of time and i think that is that's really what the women have you know they don't have the speed like the men do but they have good technique you know and they Mm -hmm. they do have good strength and so i think you're right like on stage three since it's not timed they probably have a better chance at that than stage two Yeah. yeah see i'm not sure i agree so stage three is so upper body intensive that I mean I think Megan could kill it, and Jeff and maybe Jeff and Michelle. Yeah, there's there's a couple that could for sure uh, could make make a good run of it. But I, I feel like so much upper body is going to be really taxing on a lot of the women who are more balanced and uh, you know really talented athletes. And I really I think we'll see someone come uh, where they're ramping up the difficulty. It's hard to say, but I think we'll. See, we have a really good shot of a woman completing this year, especially um, seeing uh, the work that Jesse and Michelle, in particular, those two have put in this past year to to get even stronger. I think that the, they have the best shot of actually completing. I think uh, they stage do one. as well. I think, you know, I think Casey is just as strong, but I think unfortunately, there because of her height, there's like the mistakes with the trampoline and stuff I don't even know but you know the jumping spider and that um but you know it's interesting because when I wrote that article about the women of American Ninja Warrior I had done some research you know beforehand and I saw an interview with Kent Weed you know the executive producer of the show and he said he said he feels very confident that we will see our first woman complete stage one this year. So I thought that was interesting. Hmm. You know, it, ultimately for me, um, one of the biggest deficits that a lot of these women have to conquer is just uh, acclimating to the trampolines of American Ninja Warrior. And I feel like if they're not using too many, um, I guess, I don't know, trampoline obstacles or trampoline intensive obstacles. I think that you're going to see a lot more better shot for women to compete because when you're just seeing women compete toe toe with men on obstacles where they're not jumping a gap, they actually do very, very well. Um, it's not a situation where these, the female athletes are just, you know, not, you know, as strong or whatever you want to say for uh, compared to the men. It's not that case. It's just most of the time they're just falling in these small gaps not hitting the trampoline correctly or you know we've talked about it many times on the show maybe trampolines just aren't in tune for somebody that's at a lighter weight um so 
for me, something like the spider jump, something like that is going to be the big calling point of to see if the women can can get past it. And from there, I feel like they're going to have a huge, huge shot at completing stage one. But ultimately, I just don't know what kind of obstacles they're implementing this year. Yeah, I think that uh, height plays a, a bigger part in everything than it should. And I, I feel like that's a, a lot of times the the deciding factor and that that's really holding them back. So I think that obstacles are basically designed for people between like five, four and five, 10. So even the taller guys are having issues because the, the obstacles just aren't designed for their right. height, but right. That's true. Yeah. I think they, the obstacles are designed for a specific height range. Yeah, I don't know how they get around that. So I, I know there have been some. The body prop, I believe, has a few different positions that they can put them in um, to kind of help balance that out a bit. But again, it's it's hard to say. We'll we'll see how they do. Uh, definitely, we'll be rooting for Casey along with everyone else to to see uh, how she can do. Especially, we love Redemption, right? And and she had such a bad fall last year that we really want to see her do well this year. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think she's going to have trouble with the the increased height on the warped wall? Oh, has there been an increased height? Six yeah, inches. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be six inches higher. It's going to be hard. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, wow. I don't know. I think I think she's done that so much in training, the warp wall, you know, and she's probably aware of that. I, I don't know. Um, I think, honestly, Casey's big nemesis, it right now is the pressure there's been Uh, uh, (laughs) sorry the the pressure the pressure is huge and i feel like that's gonna be big big but the new quintuple steps i feel terrible for saying this but i don't know if she's gonna get past that (laughs) look i mean that looks out of this world yeah Yeah. what I, i just i don't know maybe it looks different on tv but that picture i saw i i didn't understand that obstacle at all really (laughs) it looks daunting doesn't it i'm like how is somebody that's like shorter gonna do this thing or anybody yeah so i don't know that does look really intimidating um but yeah i think you're right maybe besides that obstacle (laughs) yeah has a lot of pressure that because she just you know she made history and she's the first woman to complete a finals course and I think there's just so much writing on her and she got so much pressure. And so I'm hoping that because she didn't do as well, you know, last year that maybe some of that pressure has come off and hopefully she can, you know, just go back to being herself and, and just doing, you know, what she does. Yeah, I sure hope so, because you can definitely see it on her face last year with the pressure. And, you know, we've seen other um, examples of pressure getting to the athletes um, throughout the entire throughout the uh, show. As a matter of fact, um, Brent Stephenson had a lot of pressure on him that the season after he went, made it to stage three, he was the only person to make it stage three. And, you know, he didn't do as well the following season. So pressure, I feel like, is going to play a major part. And I'm, I'm curious to see how Jeff Britton acclimates to that pressure also. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like Casey's gonna really have a um, the pressure is gonna be on her, but hopefully it's alleviated somewhat. Yeah, I think it's gonna be alleviated. I think you're right. I think Jeff is gonna have the biggest pressure out of all the ninjas this year oh, because, oh, yeah. I mean, he did do it. <laughs> he did complete all the stages, and you know, can he do it again? <laughs> Uh, I think you can, but, you know, it, it is different when you have all that pressure on you. You want to definitely, you don't want to let people down. Yeah, and he had basically, like you said, he came out of nowhere last year. So he had really had no expectations put on him uh, last season, which he's going to definitely feel different this year, I'm betting. I don't know if Jeff listens to this or not, but uh, everybody's rooting for him. So it, I'm hoping, uh, I'm, I'm sure he'll do fine. Oh, yeah. I think he'll do great. Um, but yeah, now that you mentioned that new quintuple steps, oh man, right. I'm really looking forward to see how people approach that. Yeah. To be fair though. Yeah. I was just going to say like for Casey, she's done so many obstacles that nobody thought she can do. So that's the big thing about Casey Catanzaro that people love. So if she does complete even the quintuple step, even if she fails a second obstacle, that'll be huge for her. That's true. That is true. Yeah. I'm looking forward to see how that obstacle looks on TV as opposed to a photo of it. 
you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, I mean, it just looks undoable and uh, on the photo. And yeah. so I'm, I'm curious to see if it will look different on TV from a different angle. Yeah, that's a good point. Angles make, you know, all the difference. I mean, um, perhaps the photo was taken from a really low angle where the steps looked a lot more raised than they actually are. Um, yeah, on the show, hopefully, you know, it looks a little bit more realistic, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, I, I can't count the number of times I've thought an obstacle was impossible and then we see them do it, you know, especially when you see, you know, a dozen people fail on an obstacle and then someone manages to do it. I mean, Cannibal Alley being a pretty famous example of it. That's true. That is true. Yeah, or 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 even the Venice Finals last year with where Nick Coolridge was the only person to complete the uh visible ladder, right? That that obstacle, man. <laughs> I just watched one after one just fail at that obstacle. I was like, this thing's impossible. What are these people thinking? <laughs> you know, producers, but yeah, that's a good one. I know my mom watches the show before me because she's on the East Coast, um, so she'll text me the play-by-play. And I remember when she was texting me that, and she's like, "Oh, there's this dumpster diver guy," and then she's like, "Oh, the dumpster diver guy was the only one to win it." And I'm like, "What? What is going on?" <laughs> like, I can't wait to watch this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think that's it for this week. Um, so thank you very much for joining us, Cameron. It's been lots of fun having you on the show. Um, I'm sure we'll have you back sometime if you'll join us again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks, Cameron. It was awesome talking to you and, uh, yeah, finally meeting you, even if it's over, uh, you know, Skype and everything. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Hopefully we can all meet in person someday soon. (laughs) Yeah. As a runner and everything, you know, it sounds like me and you would at least have something to be like, Hey, let's run a mile, you know? Absolutely. (laughs) <laughs> yeah definitely do you have six hours to spare we can run in a circle <laughs> oh, let's not do that again that's all cameron on that one yeah <laughs> hey cameron we'll run a spartan race sometime we'll uh you know climb up some uh some obstacles or maybe some atomic climbing holes how about that yeah absolutely <laughs> atomic climbing holds wow that's a great idea if you want to get some atomic climbing hold stop by our website ninjapodcast.com you can click on our link and you can use our discount code of podcast to save yourself 10%. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to us, you can reach us at rich at ninjapodcast.com. We are at Ninja Podcast on Twitter. We are also on Instagram and Facebook. Please check us out. And once again, thank you all for listening. And I hope you have a great week. Peace. Thank you. A special thanks to Kathleen Martin for the song Player v. Player Remastered from Bandcamp.com. Thank you all for listening and have a lovely day.